afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Psychiatry uh, Grand Rounds. My name is Tony Rothschild. I'm the chair of the Grand Rounds Committee. Just a couple of um, re reminders and announcements. Um, when you signed into Zoom, you've signed into Grand Rounds, but in order to receive credit, uh, please fill out the Survey Monkey um, that was a link that was sent with the Grand Rounds announcement by Karen Lambert on Monday. Uh, Grand Rounds will be on Zoom for the rest of 2021 and also January and February of 2022. We are tentatively planning to have Grand Rounds again in person in March of 2022, but as always, it will still be available to the audience on Zoom. Um, if you have questions for the, today's speaker, please type them in the chat function and we will ask the speaker the questions at the end of his talk. Next week's Grand Rounds will be given by Dr. Michael Trimble from London, who is Professor of Behavioral Neurology at the National Hospital at Queen's Square in London. And the title of Dr. Trimble's talk is Music and the Human Brain, Creativity and Therapy. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shadu Fan, who will introduce today's speaker. Dr. Fan is Professor of Psychiatry in our department and director of the UMass Psychotic Disorders Program. Shadow. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, so um, uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, today's uh, grand round speaker, uh, Dr. Christopher uh, Correll. Dr. Correll is a professor of psychiatry at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra uh, Northwell, and uh, also a professor and the chair of the ch uh, child and adolescent psychiatry um, at uh, Charity uh, University uh, of M School of Medicine in Berlin, uh, Germany, which is one of the prestigious uh, uh, universities uh, in Europe. Uh, Professor Correll is both an adult and a child and an adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, he has been working and conducting research for the past 25 years. Uh, his research and clinical work focus on the early identification uh, characterization and treatment of youth and adults with uh, severe mental illness, including psychotic and mood disorders, psychopharmacology, uh, epidemiology, clinical trials, comparative effectiveness, uh, meta-analysis, uh, risk benefit evaluation of uh, psych psychotropic medications, and the interface between physical and mental health. Professor Correll has authored over 700 journal articles and uh, received over 40 research awards uh, um, uh, since 2014, the year of uh, inception of um, um, this metric. Um, he has been uh, listed annually by Thomson uh, Reuters uh, Web of Science as one of the 100 most influential scientific minds and top 1% uh, cited uh, scientists in the area of psychiatry. Uh, we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Correll today. And this morning uh, we had um, uh, Dr. Correll led a very um, a clinically meaningful, relevant and insightful discussion with a group of uh, uh, prescribing colleges at, uh, at UMass. Um, the title for today's uh, Grand Run Talk is Beyond Dopamine, Novel and uh, Emerging Treatment for Schizophrenia. Dr. Correll, welcome. I will leave the rest of the time to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and also for having me, unfortunately not in person, but as we've seen, I think over the last year and a half, it's been possible to really connect and also exchange ideas also via this medium. Um, before I start, I want to start with why we can't meet in person. That's because of COVID and want to encourage you to please participate in what we believe is the worldwide largest study, international study on the physical and mental impact of the pandemic in everybody across the globe in the general population and subgroups. The COVID study, Collaborative Outcome Study on Health and Functioning during Infection Times, www.cofit.com to help us stay fit. 164,000 people from 155 countries have participated, but very few in the United States, less than 5,000. We need you, your kids, your family and friends to log on and help us help others. But today I'm talking about a very exciting time in schizophrenia. Very exciting. 70 years after the serendipitous discovery of chlorpromazine, 70 years later, we may be now at the brink of having one or maybe two 
different mechanisms and maybe even three that can make it into the market. One will make it 99.999% and I'll tell you about it, but also tell you about recent approvals that also incrementally have improved our care. Before I start, I wanna give you my disclosure information. I'm fortunate to be able to work with a number of companies that are still in the brain. Many have left. It's hard to get new medications to market to combat the placebo effect and get novel mechanisms of action. And we'll be talking about some of this today. I wanna briefly start with what are the goals and targets? Then go to the recently approved drugs for total symptoms, tardive dyskinesia, relapse prevention, and then novel and emerging agents with different non-postsynaptic dopamine related mechanisms of actions for total symptoms, negative symptoms, and residual positive symptoms. And then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. So get ready for a nice ride. You know that positive symptoms are the hallmark of what we can treat right now with postsynaptic dopamine blockers. Even partial agonists ultimately have a reduction in the postsynaptic dopamine tone and are net effect dopamine blockers. But we also have other areas, negative symptoms, cognition, affective and motor symptoms. So we don't wanna make the metabolic burden and the motor symptoms that are even part of the illness worse. So our recently approved drugs all are better in that department. That's great. We've improved on safety, but we haven't really gotten much on primary negative or cognitive symptoms. Yes, less sedation, less extrapyramidal side effects, give you less secondary negative and cognitive symptoms, but there is still a big need because when you are successful in treating positive symptoms, what determines functionality is mostly the residual negative and cognitive symptomatology. Our recently approved drugs are all, all also antidepressant in action. That's great because people with schizophrenia can have depression. That's great because quality of life is the most reduced by depression, particularly early in the illness, particularly in those that have good cognition, good illness insight. They get it, what schizophrenia means. They get depressed, they kill themselves, especially in the first two to five years. So having agents that are antidepressant in action is great because we get two for one, antipsychotic action and antidepressant action. Although you know the higher the dose and the postsynaptic dopamine blockade, the less antidepressant our atypical antipsychotics get. So what are our six antidepressant antipsychotics? The PIPs, A, B, C, Aripiprazole, Brexpiprazole, Cariprazine, the loose, lurazidone and lumateperon, as well as quetiapine. Here we are safe to also treat depression or prevent it. The big problem in drug development and in rational pharmacy and polypharmacy is that we don't know the etiology of any of our psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia. So a lot of what we found is serendipitous discovery that is then taken back into the animal, back into the preclinical work, and then we do variations on the theme. All right, let's start with the most recent approved drug for schizophrenia that will be approved in December for bipolar depression, lumateperon, Keplida. What is lumateperon? It's a D2 modifying medication with a twist, maybe with an important twist. It has the tightest binding to 5-HT2A relative to D2, 60-fold more tightly, Remember, when you stimulate 5-HT2A with LSD, you can get psychotic. So maybe this very tight binding can contribute to antipsychotic efficacy. It has a built-in serotonin reuptake inhibition at the same level as the D2 blockade. But D2 is an interesting modifying principle with lumateperon. All of our other antipsychotics are the same pre- and post-synaptically, a blocker, blocks the break presynaptically, disinhibits presynaptic dopamine tone. Therefore, postsynaptically, we need to go up and up until we're at 60 to 80% blockade and get side effects. So blocking both is not good. Partial agonists, they stimulate the break. Great, we have less presynaptic output, but they also stimulate postsynaptically. So we need to go up to 90 to 100% postsynaptic dopamine occupancy so that there are no free receptors that endogenous dopamine can also give it a kick. 
Now, lumateperon functionally seems to be a partial agonist presynaptically stimulating the brain, the, uh, the, the, um, the break, less dopamine output presynaptically. Therefore, it gets away at the only approved dose of 42 milligrams with only 40% postsynaptic dopamine blockade. 40, not 60, not 80, like clozapine. So it has no appreciable EPS, prolactin elevation, or akathisia. And it has a D1 effect at the same level as D2 and indirectly seems to stimulate NMDA and AMPA, glutamatergic transmission that might be relevant for negative and cognitive symptoms has not been tested, unfortunately. We'll see whether that pans out. What are the data? The phase 2B study here that we published in biological psychiatry, good efficacy with 42, no efficacy with the double dose of 84, and similar effect size to risperidone, 0.4. And the same was true for total symptoms and for positive symptoms. Then the phase three study. Here, not the double dose, but half the dose, 42 or two thirds versus 28 milligrams. Now, very interestingly, this medication has very few side effects, so it's hard to differentiate from placebo for the patient and the rater. It missed the mark on the 28 milligrams for total symptoms, but it was an antipsychotic. Even at 28, it treated positive symptoms and CGI better than placebo. So we may need to change in schizophrenia research and approval technology and techniques from a gunshot approach of total pens that favored medications with side effects that get extra points on off-target anxiety, insomnia, agitation, to really be a schizophrenia-specific antipsychotic by targeting positive symptoms. Be it as it may, only approved for 42 milligrams based on the second study with 42 milligrams being positive. But very interestingly, this medication did not have more metabolic effects than placebo at the four and six week studies. We also looked at an open label switch study coming from other antipsychotics to lumateperon. And at six weeks, at just six weeks, this switch resulted in significantly lower LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, weight, prolactin, and triglycerides. But when two weeks of stopping lumateperon and people went back to 80% to the same exact antipsychotic, mostly risperidone or olanzapine, um, as well as uh, aripiprazole, a little bit of uh, quetiapine, then all these gains were lost. That's at six weeks. Let's look at a year. Same thing, switching to lumateperon, seven pound difference, prolactin reduced, LDL reduced, total cholesterol significantly reduced. And that didn't come at a price of having worsening in symptoms. What were the side effects with this medication? Very well tolerated. The only two side effects that were larger than placebo were somnolence, about one out of four versus one out of 10, and dry mouth. Except for that, nothing larger than placebo. Everything placebo level and everything single digit incidents. The sedation was only apparent because this was morning dosing to study the drug at the peak level. In the open label studies, when we gave it at night, 10%, 9% sedation, and people slept through very nicely. I'd already told you, no effect on weight greater than placebo, half the weight on risperidone, and also no effect on vital signs. Laboratory parameters but there were effects with risperidone and here significantly lower levels, although this was not a head-to-head -head study, risperidone was an active comparator, but when you do the randomized comparison to significantly at six weeks, less cholesterol at four weeks, sorry, this is a four week study, uh, less triglycerides and also less prolactin and body weight. Let's go to the next most recent approved drug, actually approved in June this year and now coming out into the pharmacies this month or next month, Samidorphan, a mu opioid antagonist added to olanzapine. Libalvi, 
AUX 3831. Why opioid antagonism? Because it was apparent in studies that adding dopamine uh, uh, antagonism plus opioid antagonism, people had less appetite because we get really opioid output when we eat. It's reinforcing. Now, this drug is not a weight loss drug. It is not a weight loss drug. Somebody who has been gaining 50 pounds on olanzapine, you switch them to Libalvi, no effect, no weight loss, but it stabilizes weight gain. It attenuates weight gain. Here, the first phase 2B study that we published in schizophrenia research, where patients got a one week lead in with olanzapine to differentiate weight gainers from non weight gainers. In the overall group, in the next 12 weeks thereafter, there was significantly less weight gain with ALX38, olanzapine, samidorphan versus olanzapine alone. But notice this separation started at six, five or six weeks. For, for the first four weeks, there is the same weight gain. So don't expect people to gain less weight in the first four to three to four weeks. Give them metformin, maybe give them healthy lifestyle. But then after that period of time, there is a flattening of the curve. There's no more weight gain, although with olanzapine, it keeps going, going, going. So this flattening of the curve is the most exciting part of ALX 3831 or Libalvi olanzapine summit offer. Notice that those people who came from olanzapine and then went to olanzapine summit off and didn't have a weight loss, they stabilized at the higher level, but they stabilized. There was no further weight gain. Patients leveled off. And then in the phase three study, oh, then, then the FDA said, okay, you need to do two phase three studies. First, show me that olanzapine plus samidorphan, a drug that enters the brain, has the same effect efficacy-wise for symptoms as olanzapine. And it did. Here, the active comparison of olanzapine versus placebo and olanzapine samidorphan versus placebo, both were equally well-suited in beating placebo. And then this next study needed to be six months efficacy for weight loss, or sorry, for less weight gain. And here we were able to show again, similar weight gain for four weeks, but then leveling off at week six and no further weight gain, very little, whereas with olanzapine proper, it went up. Now, olanzapine samidorphan is not weight neutral by no means, but it has significantly less weight gain. It's actually 37% less weight gain compared to the 6.6% the metabolic division of NIMH uh, of the FDA wanted percent weight change, but here you see the weight difference. So it's basically four pounds difference at six months. But the co-primaries were percent change in weight and less people gaining 10%, 50% risk reduction to gain 10%, 50% risk reduction to gain 7%, but still a considerable degree of people do gain weight. Nevertheless, when you want to use olanzapine, when you have to use olanzapine, we have an improved olanzapine. Notice that I have not shown you any metabolic data. They weren't different. At least at that time point, at six months, they weren't. And people didn't have much metabolic problems on olanzapine because we kept the BMI at 30 in people who had 15 years of antipsychotic treatment. They may have been metabolically protected. But in the subgroup of patients, we just presented the poster of US Psych Congress, the subgroup that didn't have metabolic syndrome, olanzapine samidorphan cut the risk of new metabolic syndrome in half compared to olanzapine, and the same for new onset hypertension. So there is a metabolic effect in those that are at highest risk. What were the side effects? Well, the same as with olanzapine, no difference. The samidorphan doesn't add any side effects. It only subtracts some of the weight increase. Otherwise, no surprises. What about tardive dyskinesia? Is it a forgotten side effect of postsynaptic dopamine blockers? Well, maybe when the new drugs that I will be talking in the second part of my presentation become standard of care, we may not have to worry about TD anymore, but now we do. And it's particularly associated with EPS. And masking Parkinsonism with anticholinergics doesn't help. Second generation agents have a lower risk, but it's not zero. 
as we've shown in this incidence meta-analysis, where there is still a one to 4%, one to 3% increase in annualized TD incidence rates. The lowest tardive dyskinesia incidence compared to first generation agents was with aripiprazole, a partial agonist, not causing as much postsynaptic upregulation of dopamine receptors, as well as olanzapine. Those were the safest drugs. But can we now treat tardive dyskinesia? Yes, we can with VMAT2 inhibitors. Two of them have been approved, valbenazine and dutetrabenazine. What are VMAT inhibitors? VMAT is the vesicular monoamine transporter. It's the transporter that packages presynaptically dopamine, no, epinephrine, serotonin, and histamine, the biogenic amines into the vesicles. The less is there, the less can hit the postsynaptic receptor, and therefore there is less tardive dyskinesia. This has been shown with dutetrabenazine, a modification of tetrabenazine, leading from three to twice a day dosing, less peak values, no more problem with the black boxed tetrabenazine issues of depression or of EPS and suicidality. Many doses because you need to titrate weekly by weekly. And the valbenazine has only one dose increase from 40 to 80 at the week one endpoint. We meta analyzed the data and showed yes, comparing dutetrabazine and valbenazine. The effect size is similar, and both can be used for the treatment of tardive dyskinesia. How do they differ? Well, first, Frequency of administration, valbenazine once daily, do tetrabenazine twice daily. Titration, valbenazine one step up, do tetrabenazine many steps, possible but also necessary. So more fine grained uh, adjustment. With valbenazine, no food is needed with the medication. With do tetrabenazine, it is. There are drug drug interactions and contraindications. But let's get into another area that has garnered a lot of interest, long-acting injectables, relapse prevention. So the recent approval this year was for in Vega half year, twice annual six monthly polyperidone injection with more volume, but maybe more convenience. You can come from either the once monthly after four injections or four months or the three monthly. But we also have a medication that will be approved soon, and that's the second subcutaneously injected risperidone formulation. Perseris is once monthly subcutaneous injection, not readily available injection, but TB46000, doesn't have a name yet, by Teva, is under FDA review, and that's either once monthly or twice monthly very low volume and subcutaneous. While Perseris can only be injected in the abdomen, so you need a stretcher, TV 46000 is either injected into the abdomen or the back of the arm, so you can even do it sitting down and don't need an extra room for that. Many clinics don't have stretchers sitting around. Also, TV 46000 has the advantage that within 24 hours, you have a full blood level. No titration needed for that, no wait time, no booster injection, and also no oral co-treatment. And the subcutaneous formulation might become the future. Lumateperon is currently also being tested as a sub-Q long-acting injectable. But maybe the most exciting part is not what we recently got, is what's around the corner. But obviously, this is a mixed bag because we've had excitement in the past, whether it's like the M3, M4, sorry, no, whether it's the, um, um, the glutamatergic metabotropic M3, M4 um, agonist that was the Lilly drug, whether we had Ensenaclin, the alpha-7 agonist, Bidopertin, the glycine transporter 1 inhibitor, all of them 
ultimately after positive phase three tri two trials failed. But I believe we're now here in a different ballgame. I'll talk to you about four medications. Three of them already have one positive phase two trial. They're on phase three now. They need one more positive trial and we're in the game. They are so safe. None of these medications has relevant side effects, maybe with the exception of Zanormaline and Plastrospium. We'll talk about each of them. Set 856, recently relabeled by the WHO, realizing that there's a new class of drugs, TAR1 agonist. It's called Eulodorant, Eulotarant. What is a TAR1 agonist? We'll talk about it. Zanormaline plus Trospium and Muscarinic M1, M4 agonist, agonizing, stimulating the presynaptic or the, um, the autoreceptor rather. No postsynaptic binding. CVL231, phase 1b study, isolates the brain active M4 and is a PAM. It's not an agonist that hits the receptor over the head, it's more elegant. It sits there and waits until there's transmission and then it enhances it. Positive allosteric modulation, fine tuning in the brain, that's what we need. And fourth, I will talk about pimavanserin. Pimavanserin is already approved for Parkinson's psychosis. It's an inverse 5-HT2A antagonist agonist. It's under review for Parkinson's psychosis and it has a positive study for negative symptoms and a semi-positive one for residual positive symptoms. All right, let's go through them. Let's start with the drugs for total symptoms. TAR1 agonist, what is a trace amine associated receptor? These are cool animals, free floating receptors intracellularly in the presynaptic terminal. They float around. And when trace amines bind to them or when they're agonized, they do two things. They go to the postsynaptic receptor and they hug it and internalize. It's called dimerization. And that means they remove postsynaptic open receptors from the surface. We don't need to block them and have bad effects downstream. We just eliminate them physiologically. And there's less firing presynaptically. So this might be the first treatment that carves schizophrenia at its joint. We don't think there's much wrong with a postsynaptic receptor. We do something wrong with it by blocking it. We think there's overproduction presynaptically. And here we have a drug that actually takes that down. Also, TAR1 receptors are in other areas, in the hypothalamus where satiety and food intake are regulated, in the liver, the pancreas, and the gut, all converging on improving glucose homeostasis, on reducing weight. So even pre-antipsychotic or without antipsychotic efficacy, we might have a drug here that regulates body weight and metabolic dysregulation that often is present even in first episode patients. That's the theory. Let's look at the practice published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Why? Because it's a non-postsynaptic blocker with a novel mechanism that works for psychosis. Effect size of 0.45, CEP856, Eulodorant, 17.2 points, but also significantly better for CGIS, pants positive, pants negative, general symptoms, and the BINs, the brief negative symptom score scale, and the MADRAS. Patients were not selected for negative symptoms or depression, and it was still better. It took three weeks, though, to separate. So it might be a slower going effect. We'll see whether that holds up, but it's really exciting. 0.45 effect size. What's also exciting is there are no relevant side effects none that is higher than 6.7%. And that's somnolence. Nothing more significantly greater than placebo. Weight gain, almost non-existing at four weeks. Metabolic parameters, no derangement, no prolactin effect. This looks like placebo and has an effect size of 0.45. Well, that often makes us worry, will it make it into phase three? 
when the placebo effect goes up, may not stop here. We'll see. Big phase three program underway. Next, zonomaline plus trospium. Zonomaline is an M1, M4 agonist. This has been studied 15 years ago for Parkinson's, psych sorry, for um, dementia-related psychosis and schizophrenia and had very strong effects in small studies. It even is a pro-cognitive drug, but it was shelved. The muscarinic agonism intracerebrally is great, but peripherally had too many side effects. Gastrointestinal, especially in the elderly, also problems with carving, uh, uh, um, having syncope. So it was basically seen too toxic, we can't use it. And recently, someone was very ingenious and said, well, let's pair this with a peripheral, non-centrally active antagonist at the cholinergic receptors. So an anticholinergic trospium. And with that, it balances out retaining the centrally acting effect and somewhat neutralizing the GI and other side effects. Why do we want muscarinic agonism? Well, the M4 is really what drives the, the, the effic efficacy. The M1 is more the peripheral side effect. But what we see when you have autoreceptor agonism of the M1, M4 cholinergic receptor, at the interneuronal level, you get less acetylcholine. And with less acetylcholine, you reduce basically the dopamine transmission. So again, an interneuronal rather than postsynaptic way of reducing dopamine tone and flow. Basically, in that study, it's a five-week study because there was a one-week titration phase. Patients had one to two days of 50-20, 50 is anomaly in 20 trospium. Then it went up its BID dosing to 120, and one could even go up to 125-30 milligrams based on tolerability. Most people tolerated the up titration. And you see again, New England Journal of Medicine article, because we have another way of modulating dopamine without the postsynaptic dopamine receptor. 17.2 points with euloderon, 17.4 points. So the absolute change from baseline was the same, but the effect size here was 0.75. 0.75 because the placebo effect had been controlled so well, and also negative symptoms improved, total symptoms, and um, illness severity overall. Now, this is not totally neutral when it comes to side effects. You see constipation, 17%, nausea, 17%, dyspepsia, vomiting, but very little akathisia, very little, no EPS, and also no difference in weight gain or in metabolic parameters. Now, this just needs one more study and it's in, and I'm sure it will win the next study. Even if the placebo effect triples, it will still separate. And it's also fortunately not just studied as monotherapy because what would be cool is adding this to a dopamine antagonist where well, that, that doesn't work because it blocks the break and we have too much output on the presynaptic terminal. And there may be your loderon could work or this drug interneuronally toning down dopamine tone. So we may be able to construct our new clozapine by having two different alleys into reducing dopamine tone. And that could be via your loderon or M1, M4 agonism. But the reason why I believe that this will make it in the next study is this study, CVL231, the muscarinic M4 agonist, PAM, positive allosteric modulator. So again, by stimulating the autoreceptor, you have less cholinergic output, which reduces dopamine. This was a phase 1b study. It wasn't even targeted to be efficacious on the, on the significance level for symptoms. It was safety and PK. So a small study, they did it versus placebo to see which dose should we use. Should we use either 
30 milligrams once a day or 20 milligrams twice a day, only 27 patients in each group. That's a pilot study. What can you expect from a study like that in schizophrenia? Guess what? Both doses, 30 milligrams once a day and 20 twice a day were significantly better than placebo. That's amazing. We have very potent medications here. Now, again, the placebo effect was small. Usually it's in the 12 points, but the drug effect was 17.9 and 19.5. And there was also significant benefit already for the 30 milligrams once daily for positive symptoms and for negative symptoms for both. So we have a new mechanism of action muscarinic agonism, especially M4 or positive allosteric modulation that seems to confer significant antipsychotic efficacy. What about side effects? Very, very few. Except for headache, which is the same as placebo, everything single digit, nothing greater than placebo. No weight gain, no metabolic problems, no EPS, no akathisia. So we're in an era here where at least one of those will make it and that will revolutionize our combination treatment, our monotherapy, and some of the side effects we feared for decades will be much less relevant. Let's go to negative symptoms and talk about pimavanserin. Pimavanserin 5-HT2A, serotonin 2A, inverse agonist, and also an antagonist. 34 milligrams are already approved for Parkinson's disease. Why would we be interested in inverse agonism on the 5-HT2A receptor? Remember, inverse agonism puts the gear in reverse. Actually, in the prefrontal and also nigrostraddle pathway, inverse agonism on 5-HT2A induces some dopamine output. Serotonin and dopamine are in balance. As you block serotonin, you're enhancing somewhat dopamine. And that's the idea prefrontally that it could help with negative symptoms. And it also reduces EPS. That's the whole idea around the second generation antipsychotics. Serotonin, dopamine antagonism, via serotonin antagonism, you reduce somewhat the dopamine blockade related EPS. This is an augmentation study. All the other studies we looked at were monotherapy trials. Here, either 20 milligrams or 34 were added to the ongoing antipsychotic in people with predominant negative symptoms. So that very little positive symptoms left so that you can isolate the effect of 5-HT2A inverse agonism on the negative symptoms. And what were the results? Significant but small effect size, 0.21 for the NSA-16, the negative symptom assessment scale. Somewhat inconsistent results because the pants negative didn't separate, but two of the seven symptoms are cognitive and not negative. Also, no significant effect on CGIS. But the 0.21 effect size was driven by the lower dose of 20 milligrams, no difference from placebo. The 34 milligrams had a 0.34 effect size, and that's what's currently carried over into the phase three program. Advantage, again, no side effects to speak of. Everything 7% or less. Nothing that we would be uh, concerned about. And since this drug has been approved already for years for Parkinson's psychosis, there will be no surprises. Whereas with the other drugs, could there be a low level or low frequency severe side effect? Possibly, we'll have to see. There was also a drug, roluperidone, MIN-101, that was tested for negative symptoms. 5-HT2A antagonist, not inverse agonist, and a sigma-2 antagonist. Sigma-2 receptors also modulate dopamine. In the first study, significant effect versus placebo. But the placebo effect was minuscule, one and a half points, only done in Eastern Europe, Ukraine. So this was unbelievable. Plus the three and a half points for the drug were not really to write home about with a 28 point baseline. So in the phase three study, no significant effect anymore. 
drug effect didn't increase much, placebo effect did. So it's unclear whether this will be pursued again, although one has to say this was a p-value of 0.06. So could it still be relevant? We'll see. The big point here is this is monotherapy. Patients are stopping their antipsychotic and they're put on a drug that we don't even know that it's antipsychotic in order to improve negative symptoms. So the fear is that people might relapse without any postsynaptic dopamine blockade. But there was an effect on the higher dose for personal and social performance for functionality. So it's unclear whether this will be pursued. Then there were two negative studies looking at the NMDA transmission for negative symptoms. One was the DAAO, D-amino acid oxidase inhibitor, TUC831. The D-amino acid oxidase is the enzyme breaking down internal D-serine. And D-serine is a coagonist at the NMDA receptor. It's needed for NMDA transmission, glutamatergic drive. But blocking this enzyme did not lead to negative symptom improvement. However, in that study that was negative, squarely negative, there was an effect, a signal for cognition, and this is now being taken into the cognition study world. And there was another attempt at increasing D-serine, not by reducing its degradation, but by increasing the externally provided D-serine by deuterating D-serine and making it more bioavailable. And that was also squarely negative. And a phosphodiesterase 10A, PDE 10A inhibitor also failed. Let me stop with the last study, which is again, pimalanserin. You know it already. Here it was given not for residual negative, but for residual positive symptoms. And unfortunately, it didn't work. Had an effect size of 0.17, just missed the PO5. But the reason why I'm showing this to you is there was a pre configured a priori subgroup analysis. And that was done in the 80% of patients that were studied in European sites, not the US. And there, pimavanserin did separate for adjunctive treatment for adjunctive residual positive symptoms. And in the overall group, it was also significantly better than placebo for negative symptoms, for CGIS, and for another negative symptom assessment score. So there seems to be something that Pimavanserin is doing. I hope the company will further pursue this also for residual positive and not only for negative symptoms. Again, like in the advanced study for negative symptoms and the enhanced study, no relevant side effects greater than placebo, everything very safe. So let me finish up by summarizing the tour for you that we've undertaken. Lots of drugs, some approved, some under investigation, some of the information quite new for some of you. Recent FDA approval for Luma Tepron, a D2 agent with a clear twist because it's a partial agonist pre and an antagonist postsynaptically on the D2 reset. It also has very tight 5-HT2A binding and a D1-related increase in glutamatergic drive. Two VMAT2 inhibitors, dutetrabenzene and valbenazine for the treatment of TD, ALX3831 or olanzapine plus amidorphan, like olanzapine for efficacy, less weight gain, and the six-monthly polyperidone approved. Under investigation, unapproved yet, TAR1 agonist eulodorant for total symptoms, zanormaline and trospium, the M1, M4, agonist for total symptoms, CVL231, the M4 positive allosteric modulator for positive symptoms, adjunctive pimavanserin for negative symptoms, and under review for FDA approval, TV46000, the subcutaneous risperidone for relapse prevention. Mixed results for ruluperidone for negative symptoms, monotherapy, unclear whether it's an antipsychotic, 5-HT, 2A antagonist, sigma 2 antagonist. Pimavanserin for residual positive symptoms. Could you, if the insurance pays it, give pimavanserin and add it to a dopamine blocker? You could, but cost $60,000 per year because of the Parkinson's psychosis indication. 
and negative trials for adjunctive DAAO inhibitor TAC831, deuterated D-serine, and PDE10A inhibitor. Clearly, also as we've seen in the morning when we discussed a lot of treatment-resistant patients, we need novel mechanisms of action. After 70 years of postsynaptic doping blockade, we need something different. Interestingly, it all still seems to converge on dopamine, but it can be done more elegant and more physiologic. So let me stop here. Thank you for your attention. And again, ask you to please participate in the COFIT study, www.cofit.com to help us help others. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Correa. Um, so um, I'm not sure, that, Tony, you, you, you have first question. I'm not sure Dr. Correa uh, fully addressed the question or you? Yeah. Uh, you want to read it or you want me to ask it? Oh, yeah, maybe you could ask. I know you're also involved in the study, right? The semi-dolphin study, maybe you could. Uh, oh, no, uh, I was involved in semi-dolphin for depression, but... Um, um, Christoph, um, you know, the data is pretty clear that the, if the samodorphin is added to a lanzapine, you will have less weight gain. And I think clinicians would want to use it, you know, if they make a decision to use a lanzapine, which is very popular amongst clinicians, they'll want to use it straight away before, before the patient gets all the weight gain. Do you, think, do you think the insurance companies and the payers are going to allow that? It's a good question. Um, so I think there are two scenarios. It could be try olanzapine first and show me that there's weight gain. That should be easy to do. So a fail first, but does it need to be one week, two weeks, four weeks? Because we get continuous weight gain for another four weeks on Libalvi. So that's one issue. The other issue could be if someone uh, needs olanzapine and has weight gain on other drugs, and we know olanzapine would also cause weight gain, that then they could go straight to, to Olanzapine Summit often. Uh, it will be interesting, the negotiations, how they go, but it will be first a generic drug for sure before you can give the branded. Uh, Christopher, I have a follow-up question. So uh, I remember many years ago, there were studies uh, about the combination of Olanzapine and the metformin uh, used in both the chronic patients uh, who already gained weight and also in first steps of the patient as a kind of prevention. Um, uh, of a metabolic uh, side effect. So now you compare that combination uh, versus this combination. The um, what? What um, do you think? Uh, one combination is better than the other? Yeah, there are obviously no head-to-head -head studies. Um, the effect of metformin is about two and a half to three kilograms at 16 weeks. Here it was about two kilograms at 26 weeks. But again, we took a maybe metabolically more protected group that had not gained that much weight. Uh, in 12 years. So the olanzapine effect itself was attenuated. So I don't know. Um, I, I rather would favor uh, giving Libalvi um, and add metformin for the first six weeks uh, in order to cap the initial weight gain and then have the samidorphin work. I, or you could pre-treat someone with samidorphin, but samidorphin is not available. That would be cool too, that you have like a starter pack of six weeks samidorphin. It might then take some time for the brain to re-regulate uh, re and then, then give the olanzapine summit off in combination. But we don't know the, the, the difference in metformin. I mean, metformin can have side effects um, and it's a second pill, but yeah, um, it's unclear who responds to which of the two interventions better and how, what the effect size would be. Okay. There's a question in the chat box. Uh, why would the TAR1 have such a different effect if it also reduces dopaminergic stimulation on post-synaptic receptors, just like a classic or any other uh, antipsychotic medications. Why would it what? I, I didn't understand. Why would a TAR1 uh, uh, have such a different effect as you just uh, presented that? Uh, did the uh, TAAR1? Yeah, but why would, uh, what, what, what does it mean by different effect? I don't understand. Uh -huh. What's What's the difference? Uh, it's also it's an antipsychotic. It has the same effect, 17 and a half points, which we see with other drugs. It's just another way of reducing dopamine transmission by either um, having less dopamine receptors available because they're internalizing after dimerization and less firing. So it's just another way of uh, reducing dopamine transmission. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, I'm not exactly uh, sure either. Uh, Maybe the person a... can write it again if, if I didn't answer the question. Uh huh. Alexander, if you want to uh, 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 clarify your question, uh, you can uh, type in the chat box. But I have a follow-up question about the Taiwan, um, because we are involved in a uh, Roche study uh, with the Taiwan mechanism, uh, primarily for negative symptoms. So do you feel like uh, this um, this is more like uh, promising for negative symptoms? I, I know you just showed the kind of total symptoms. So. Yes, uh, so I mean, I didn't uh, show you the long term. We postered this, uh, the long term extension data, which was quite impressive. This was more for safety, but the negative symptoms continued going down and down and down. Maybe next time I'll, I'll add the, the, the poster slide. But um, there seems to be something, but it wasn't controlled against placebo. That's why I didn't show it. But the, the negative symptoms improved in the acute study, yet this could be pseudo specific, correct? As your positive symptoms improve, you are less paranoid, you're less worried, you're less hearing voices, you're more smiling and reaching out to other people. But the, the open label extension study seems to suggest there is a specific effect on negative symptoms. Okay. Uh, so uh, Alexander just kind of clarified uh, further about his question. He said, I just meant that it seems that it, it's in efficacy for psychosis and its side effect profile appear to be very different from other antipsychotics, which I thought was curious. So, so the the profile, yeah, yeah. but the efficacy is not different and the side effect profile has to be different because it doesn't sit at the postsynaptic receptor. So there can't be a dopamine uh, a blockade related effects like EPS, akathisia, prolactin elevation. That it doesn't have the metabolic and weight issue that's something where it's just different in the brain but because the tar one receptors are also in different areas as i mentioned hypothalamus uh, pancreas liver and and um, uh, stomach as well as gut so might there be a long-term effect that we're not aware of that this tar one modulation does we'll see but it, it, all, none of these three or four agents should have the side effects of doping blockers because they're not doping blockers. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, so for, for the audience, please feel free to type more questions. Uh, but at the same time, maybe I have a question. Uh, so uh, we're also involved in another study from Avenir, uh, the compound uh, was well, a combination called AVT786, uh, which is a combination of D6 to DM and uh, low dose uh, quinidine. Um, for negative symptoms. So I'm not sure, I know you did not include any in, the, in your talk, but uh, uh, do you have any comments on that? Uh, that that's a, also a separate mechanism. Uh, so what's the active ingredient? Is that the lorazodone that they repurpose with quinidine? Or is yeah, that Avenir? A, or is that the Avenir drug? Yeah, Avenir drug. Oh yeah, so that's dextromethorphan. Okay. Yes. Yeah, dextromethorphan is, um, I, I think that's, that's a medication in, in seeking for an indication. It has been tried in agitation in the elderly. It has been tried in so many things. Dextromethorphan is, uh, is basically an NMDA uh, antagonist and should work uh, like an antidepressant, but nothing yet uh, has been um, positive on this one. Uh, the AXO5 is uh, also dextromethorphan, but with bupropion. And it's a drug that has positive studies in unipolar depression, um, but not in TRD, there it failed. So I'm not sure that this uh, mechanism will ultimately pan out. So I didn't include it because they didn't have a positive study yet. I only included drugs with at least one positive study. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, I know you did not cover much about the cognitive um, symptom, the cognitive uh, enhancer. Uh, as we know in the field, um, probably five, 10 years ago, that was a, such a hot kind of a area. Uh, everybody wanted to pursue um, medication, but uh, there was such a disappointment. So at this time, do you have any exciting <laughs> message to, to share? Yeah, I left, I left this one out, uh, although I could have included it. There, there are two, two drugs that I left out. One actually that will be approved, and I'm sorry about that 
that is um, um, the BXL drug. Uh, well, I'll talk about that in a second. So let's start, stop with, start with the cognition. Beringer Ingelheim has uh, a phase 2b study positive with a glycine transporter inhibitor. So it's again trying to have NMDA transmission increased. And uh, while it failed for negative symptoms uh, in the hands of Roche and Genentech, the Bitopertin story, um, they are now pursuing it for uh, cognition and schizophrenia. So we'll see uh, whether they get a second study that's positive. The problem is I don't know how much this is really so hardwired that we cannot potentially change it. What, what I left out is BXL, and then a, there's a number after it. It's, this is um, um, an alpha-2 agonist that is available at dex, uh, dextromedetomidine dextromedetonidine that is basically an alpha-2 agonist that is available IV as an anesthetic, but you may know that clonidine and guanfacine are drugs against aggression for uh, autism and uh, ADHD. They are ADHD medications. This drug uh, will get approval for agitation in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, where it basically uh, does treat the agitation. The reason why I had this Freudian uh, uh, exclusion of the medication is that I think it's a problem. Why would we give it if we have um, benzodiazepines that are dirt cheap, if we have haloperidol that you can give one injection in the emergency room, uh, or even second generation agents that are injectable. So I'm, I'm not sure this will definitely make it, but it's at least a new mechanism of action that we should be aware of. And if, if insurers allow us to use it, maybe get our hands on to treat um, agitation while it's still in the escalating phase because it's an oral drug. Okay. So there's a question in the chat box about the psychotic depression. So for all the novel compounds you just introduced, uh, any implication or um, relevance, uh, particular relevance to psychotic depression, that's actually Tony's, uh, Tony's bill. Yeah, so that's, that's your, your um, uh, expertise area of specific expertise, obviously. Well, I mean, I think first you could say that any antipsychotic could be used in psychotic conditions, correct? And we know that mood disorders are particularly vulnerable to a postsynaptic dopamine blocking effects. Um, so here, adding it to an antidepressant would be one possibility. But I think you may be thinking about monotherapy. So we, we, I don't think we know well enough how much these agents have intrinsic antidepressant efficacy in addition to the antipsychotic efficacy. Maybe the TAR1 agonist because it has such potent negative symptom effects apparently. And it also, uh, the, 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 the madras was positive, the effect, even though people are not selected for depression in the phase 2B study. So that might be the lowest hanging fruit uh, of, the, of the four agents. But I think we just have too little information. Uh -huh. I know we're about to run out of time, but the one last question. I think it's a big topic about the non-compliance, the treatment compliance. So maybe you could comment on uh, the new drug development and um, in the context of uh, medication compliance, uh, including like not injectable. Yes. So I mean, one one route into non-adherence is uh, inefficacy. Another one is lack of illness insight, but the third one is side effects. So maybe once we have drugs available, the newer ones that don't cause um, side effects that reduce quality of life, like brain fog and uh, slowing and weight gain, uh, people might adhere to the medication a bit more. But if not, then the LAIs are really a way to go, I think, especially nowadays where we don't have these other drugs yet available. And even atypicals uh, were thought to increase the adherence over typical antipsychotics because of less side effects that didn't happen. So having now subcutaneous injectables available, having different injection intervals, once monthly, two monthly, three, and even six monthly enhances our availability. And we need more drugs. So um, Brexpiprazole is being studied at the moment in an in a LAI program, Lumateperon in a deuterated phase as a form is also being tested. So I think having more drugs available. Also, um, now the subcutaneous injection methodology might make it possible to even formulate drugs that were not possible to inject deeply because they had too much volume. So olanzapine 
uh, also not entering the bloodstream could be formulated this way and not having the post-injection somnolent sedation syndrome, maybe lurazidone. So as we get more drugs available as LAIs, that would be helpful. But also don't forget about cariprazine. Cariprazine with its didesmethyl metabolite has a one week half-life. After five weeks oral treatment, you should be able based on PK to just monitor the patient once a week and give them one tablet and they should have a stable blood level. I've talked to the company so often that they should develop this into a once weekly oral drug. We'll see, but there's now a company that actually has a formulation to put generic drugs into a coat that it travels through the, uh, the GI system for a week and actually you get can make daily medications into weekly medications. So that might be a future development uh, where we have some of this, where we can actually supervise patients at least every Sunday when we see them. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Correa, for such an informative talk and um, some hopeful uh, message. Um, yeah, uh, this concludes this um, grand round talk. Uh, Tony, you have any final words? Uh? Well, thank you very much, Christoph. I would only add that I, I keep telling all these companies there's no FDA approved medication for psychotic depression. And so the market is wide open for them. Yeah. Yeah, good okay. point. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, Be thank healthy you. as well to see you okay. hopefully you soon again. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank care. you. Okay.